Hi, I'm Filippo Voltaggio with Life Changes, and I'm here at the Reconnections, the U.S. Mastery Conference, and I'm having the pleasure of talking to Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is not only a chiropractor, but he's a biologist and a chemist and a neurologist, and, and was featured on the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? And so I remember watching that movie, and one of the things I came away with is that we can control our thoughts. Now, I'm just going to dive right in and ask you this question. Okay, so we can control our thoughts, and sometimes we know with our thoughts that we're not supposed to do something, and then we do it anyway. Yeah. What's up with that? <laughs> well, um, most people, when they do something that they enjoy doing, even though that they know it's not good for them, whether they're eating uh, chocolate cake and having a feeding frenzy or they're using um, drugs or they're using alcohol or they're uh, deciding not to exercise uh, there's a part of the brain that's responsible for pleasure it's called the pleasure center and so when we do that action we produce an emotion that feels good mm -hmm. and we want to do it again and so we always want to try to reproduce that same feeling again but the problem is is that as we begin to do certain things that bring us pleasure or bring us joy or, or or obsessive or addictive we tend to want to do it more because the next time we use the next time we eat chocolate the next time we um, uh, or drink or the next time we use a drug the receptor sites on the outside of the cells in the pleasure centers become desensitized so the next mm. time you have to use a little bit more you got to turn it on a little bit more mm. so People lose their what's called executive function, and that's uh, the forebrain, which is responsible for you know decisions that are in our best interest, the long-term vision. And so the immediate gratification, of course, produces an emotional response that tends to be somewhat uh, addicting as well. So most people make those choices because it feels good, and their pleasure centers have actually become hijacked. Their pleasure centers are now at a higher level, so they got to do it again to try to get that same rush. So if we eat one small piece of cake, the next time we come back to it, we have to eat a bigger piece of cake in order to get the same amount of pleasure out of it. Right, but only if you have an addiction. Now, some people don't have that type of brain chemistry or don't have that type of, of problem. You know, they can eat a piece of cake or they could, you know, have a drink or two and they're fine. But there's certain people that have had their pleasure centers actually hijacked or they've had trauma or they've had drama or they've had, you know, a shock or loss in their life <clears throat> and that experience has produced an emotion that they actually can't regulate on their own. So that change in brain chemistry um, is a hole that then they try to fill. Mm. And so they look for something outside of them to try to make that feeling go away. And so for some people when they eat that piece of chocolate cake, the moment they have that experience with something outside of them, that chocolate, the taste and the smell and the aroma and the flavor changes their internal chemistry. It brings them pleasure. So they pay attention to what caused it and they want to do it again. And so now they get in this cycle of addictions. And so for some people it's chocolate cake, some people it's buying the sports car in their midlife because they mm. realize that that feeling isn't going away any longer. They buy the boat, they join the new social club, you know, they go on vacation. But when the novelty of all of that wears off, they return back to that emotion again. And so. Um, I think there's a real strong interest right now with people beginning to look to see how we find happiness or joy from within us, not having to rely on something else external. Hmm. I'd, I'd like to go a little deeper. So we have these extremely intelligent people running around doing extremely stupid things, even though logically they could reason, if I have this drink, if I buy this sports car, if I go out with this woman, It'll ruin my marriage or, you know, it'll ruin my life, it'll ruin my career. Yet, they're drawn to that and you're giving us the reason why because it's an actual biological thing. Sure. But what do we do about that? Sure. Well, <clears throat> you know, this is uh, where we start looking at a whole new branch of psychology or a whole new branch of therapy, you know. Talk therapy is not going to change it, you know, mm. because really their, their, their emotion that they've memorized, whether it's emptiness or pain or suffering or loss, that emotion or guilt, they've memorized and it's, they've memorized it so well that it actually has become an addiction in of, of itself. Hmm. So 
they're addicted to some emotion and they're trying to regulate their emotions by doing something outside of them. So when that person reaches, unfortunately, rock bottom, when they hit the lowest point in their life where they can't go on any longer, business as usual, that's when they began to examine themselves. Like, they start to ask those questions like, what do I have to change in myself? What do I have to, th what do I have, let me examine my thoughts, let me examine my behaviors, let me examine my uh, emotions. And because of the size of the of frontal lobe, the executive brain, you and I can observe who we're being. We can pay attention to those things so that we can modify our behaviors to do a better job in life. Now, it's not an easy process, but understanding then that you can change in a state of pain and suffering, you know, when you reach rock bottom, or you can change in a state of inspiration and joy. And I think that people now are beginning to look at other, um, uh, other options instead of hitting rock bottom. So energy psychology and energy medicine and all these new techniques that are being created are wonderful techniques that actually unmemorize emotions that have been rooted in the subconscious in the body. So the rock bottom is almost a reset. Exactly. And you're saying that we could reset at a higher level before we reach rock bottom, where rock bottom is through pain, we could reset through joy. Right. And I, the, the, reason, the biggest reason is, if you think about this, you and I always know better. See, the one thing about human beings is we have conscience. And so mm. you and I always know better. We always know better. Well, you and I always know better, but not everybody no, knows everybody better. everybody knows better. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we thought you were paying me a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody knows better. And because that, if they continue onward, then, then they're making a choice that actually is undermining their future. So the new model is if you have certain things you'd like to change. I mean, for example, they used to say the personality was hardwired. By the time you're 35 years old, you're pretty much sealed as a personality. Well, the current research in neuroscience tells us that you can change at any age. We're changed by everything we learn, everything we experience, every mm. dream, every fantasy. Our brain is always changing, and so, so is our genes. So we, we don't have to wait for that point. We can actually say every single day, we can begin to think about what is a greater ideal of myself? How would I like to express myself? How would I like to be differently today? And by beginning to make small, simple choices or begin to think differently or begin to act differently or begin to let go of certain emotions and transform anger into joy or pain into freedom, it's just the same energy. It's just held in the body a certain way. So hmm. there's a lot of science that's beginning to give people permission to change. Speaking about permission, Joe, you're Italian-American, I'm Italian-American of heritage and descent at least. Uh, there's so much passion in that culture. And, and I don't know about you, but we've grown, I've grown up seeing people fight and people do the craziest things. And, you know, people say there's excitement there. And, and I, one could argue that some of the greatest works of art that were ever sure. done in Italy were because of this exact process that we're talking about. Right. So if you took that away, what would we have? Well, you know, emotions are the fuel to creativity. Now, you don't necessarily have to suffer in the process, but, you know, uh, the Italian culture or Italian-American culture, there is an element where emotions are very real. And emotions really are important catalysts for us to embrace the creative process but they're also very destructive when we can't move off them. Mm. So when we reach a tragic moment or a difficult moment, there comes a point where we have to actually transform it and let it go. And so I think a lot of cultures have that kind of phenomenon that goes on, whether you're from Turkey or from Italy or from Spain, there's a commonality that takes place. And, and um, you know, we're talking about, you know, the, the emotions of stress that actually are the driving factors that cause people to reach a lower denominator. You know, that, that primitive nervous system, that fight or flight nervous system, you know, that creates those hormones that begin to cause people to be, you know, to, to perceive things differently than they really are. So, you know, fighting, flighting, feeding, and fornicating, it sounds like an Italian dinner, you know? <laughs> I mean, and that's pretty much the, the primitive nervous system at work. Now, when you, when you have that experience and you have those emotions and you could actually 
transform those emotions or transmute those emotions into creativity. The same energy of anger is the same energy of joy. It's mm. just what you do with it. Mm.